Hello and welcome to today's case study, which is titled Intergenerational Transmission of Trauma and Interfamily Communication Styles in Forcibly Displaced Families Seeking International Protection in Ireland. And this case study was set in Ireland's National Centre for the Rehabilitation of Victims of Torture, which is called Sporazi. My name is Natalie Flanagan and I have a PhD in Psychotraumatology. This case study took place within a broader research consortium called CONTEXT. And CONTEXT is an international interdisciplinary research consortium with a special focus on trauma exposed populations. In today's presentation, I'm firstly going to provide a brief overview of global European and Irish displacement and migration trends. I will then present to you a brief snapshot of the Irish reception system for international protection applicants, which is called the direct provision system. I will then introduce the site of this case study, that is Ireland's National Centre for the Rehabilitation of Victims of Torture, Sporazi. Then I will go on to summarise the relevant research relating to mental health in forcibly displaced populations focusing in on intergenerational transmission of trauma and intrafamily communication. I will conclude by discussing the implementation utility of the research in the context of Sporazi. So the most recent figures from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees estimates that in excess of 79.5 million individuals were forcibly displaced from their homes by the end of 2019 globally. Global political instabilities and transformations have precipitated protracted wars and conflicts in countries like Venezuela, Myanmar, Yemen, Afghanistan and Syria. And they have proceeded unprecedented numbers of people fleeing their homes to seek safety and protection. Over half of these individuals are under the age of 18. This graph illustrates a longer term upward trend in displacement. However, these are conservative estimates and they are likely to dim more so than illuminate the true magnitude of forced displacement and migration. So within the figure of 79.5 million forcibly displaced individuals, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees broadly categorises these individuals into three main groups. These are refugees, which comprise 26 million of this group, asylum seekers, which comprise 4.2 million of this group, and internally displaced people, or IDPs, which include 45.7 million people. So a refugee is defined by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in 1951 as a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country, or who not having a nationality and being outside the country of his or her former habitual residence, is unable or owing to such fears unwilling to return to it. So this 1951 convention, which is commonly called the Geneva Convention, and the subsequent protocol were ratified by 145 state parties. The Convention requires that all member states respect and protect the rights of refugees. This article, or the Refugee Convention, it anchors the rights of refugees across international legal frameworks, including Ireland. The term refugee can describe a number of categories of people dependent on a country's legal framework. If granted refugee status, the individual in question is entitled to many of the same rights as a national citizen. An asylum seeker is often referred to as the applicant, as they are an individual who, speak, who seeks to be recognised as a refugee under the terms of the 1951 Refugee Convention. 
Therefore, an asylum seeker may be defined as a person who has left their country and who is seeking protection from persecution and serious human rights violations in another country, but who hasn't yet been legally recognised as a refugee and they are waiting to receive a decision on their asylum claim. Importantly, during the time that their asylum claim is being examined, the asylum seeker must not be forced to return to their country of origin. The final group is internally displaced people, and these refer to people who have been displaced to other areas within the borders of their own country. In Europe, 676,300 asylum seekers applied for international protection in 2019. And this figure represented an 11.2% increase from 2018. Syria, Afghanistan and Venezuela represent the top three citizenships of those seeking asylum in Europe. And Spain, France, Germany and Greece represented the four EU member states which received the most first-time applicants for international protection. Here in Ireland, growth trends in applications largely parallel those reported elsewhere in Europe, with 2019 seeing a 34.9% increase from 2018. By the end of 2019, there were 7,330 pending applications for international protection. Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Albania, Georgia and South Africa represented the top five citizenships for applicants. Ireland's reception system for those seeking international protection is called direct provision. The direct provision system is overseen by the Reception Integration Agency, which is a division of the Department of Justice and Equality. This system was originally introduced in 2000 and was originally envisaged as very much a short term solution to house residents for up to six months. However, 20 years later, this system is very much still in existence with the residents spending significantly longer periods of time waiting for asylum claim decisions. The system is referred to as direct provision as the state directly provides bed, board and medical care to those seeking international protection. Currently, there are 39 centres or residential institutions nationally, the majority of which are run on a for-profit basis by private contractors on behalf of the state. Only two centres are self-catering, only three centres are system or purpose built, that is that the other 36 centres in the research portfolio were built with different purposes in mind. For example, some of them were former holiday homes and hotels. Only seven are state owned. The most recent available statist statistics tell us that the current contract capacity of all centres currently stands at 98.7%. Currently, those seeking international protection are waiting approximately 24 months for a decision on their international protection claim. This map shows the location of the direct provision centres nationally, and as you can see here, there is quite a good level of dispersal throughout Ireland. This is an example of one of the centres. It is located in the Midlands of Ireland in Athlone County, Westmeath. The most recent figures suggest that the contract capacity for this particular centre is 300 people and the current contracted occupancy is 280 people. This centre is one of the centres that was not purpose built. As you can see, it used to be a mobile home camp and it is owned by a private contractor and run on a for-profit basis on behalf of the state. In 2015, an independent working group was tasked with conducting the first comprehensive review of the protection system, census introduction in 2000. 
This is often called the working group report. The working group identified and reported a number of factors that were problematic for those living within these institutions. Many of these factors directly impact the mental health and well-being of those living here. Some of the factors or variables identified in the report included a lack of personal autonomy and self-agency. For example, applicants or individuals not being able to cook a meal for themselves, a lack of privacy, as many of the people living in these centres have to share rooms and bedrooms, boredom and isolation, living in uncertainty. They don't know, for example, when they may get an answer to their asylum case. A loss of skills and creation of dependency, as access to the labour market can be quite onerous. There is an impact on parents' capacity to parent their full potential, and therefore an impact on children being born and spending their formative years in this institutional environment. Moreover, you will find vulnerable persons with trauma histories in shared rooms. And all of these together have a negative additive effect on physical, mental and emotional health. Although this review was conducted in 2015, five years later, many of these factors and variables are still reported as directly affecting the well-being of those living within these centres. If I were to summarise the working group report in one quote, it would be this that people conducting the report found a constant underlying theme is one of intense frustration or despair and fear that they, the residents, may not be capable of independent living when they get a final decision. It is against this contact contextual backdrop of international protection systems in Ireland, including the direct provision system, where the site of this case study is found. The organisation in question is called SPRASI, or the Spirit and Asylum Services Initiative, and SPRASI is Ireland's national centre for the rehabilitation of victims of torture. SPRASI is the only member state of the International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims in Ireland. It is a humanitarian, intercultural, non-governmental organisation that works with asylum seekers, refugees and other disadvantaged migrant groups. And it has special concern for survivors of torture. Sprazi takes a holistic approach and work towards promoting the well-being of the individual and self-reliance for societal integration in Ireland. Sprazi adopts an intersectoral collaborative approach and it works with a number of government bodies, for example, justice and health. Furthermore, Sprazi has a growing research component. There are a number of PhDs being conducted there currently with each PhD seeking to inform and develop best practice and to contribute to the field of torture rehabilitation. So what is torture? The United Nations Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, published in 1987, defines torture as this. Any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for the purposes of obtaining information or confession, or indeed for the purposes of intimidating or coercing him for any reason based on discrimination. Torturous practices include suspension, asphyxiation, beatings, electric shocks, forced body positions, traumatic removal of tissues or appendages, and solitary confinement. Freedom from torture is an agreed upon human right as guaranteed and enshrined under international law. However, sources do indicate that government sanctioned torture is commonly is committed in more than 130 countries worldwide. Ireland signed the United Nations Convention Against Torture in 1999 and it was ratified in 2000 by the Criminal Justice Act with Article 14 of the Act mandating that Ireland provide as full a rehabilitation as possible for victims of torture. <laughs>
In Ireland, SPRASI is the primary organisation seeking to implement the obligations of the state pursuant to Article 14, and it does so through the provision of a range of therapeutic services. So services provided at SPRASI are very much multidisciplinary and they traverse medical, legal, psychosocial and therapeutic spheres. Medical legal services comprise the assessment and provision of medical legal reports. And these are legal documents which go towards supporting an applicant for an international protection who has had a history or experience of torture in their country of origin. Psychosocial services encompass supporting Sprazi clients in accessing external, formal and informal support. So informal supports may include community or peer support groups, whereas more formal supports can include accessing welfare, healthcare and legal frameworks. Therapeutic services at Sprazi include individual, family and group therapy. Therapeutic groups at Sprazi are very much predicated on Sue de Thurman's trauma recovery model. This model comprises three sequential stages. The first is safety and stabilisation. The second is processing of the traumatic experiences. And the third is reconnection and integration. Therapeutic groups focus on aiding Sparazi clients to rebuild a sense of safety and to provide practical stress management techniques to aid sleep, anxiety and somatic pain. Furthermore, therapeutic groups, they help prepare the client for engaging in trauma processing work with an individual therapist at a later stage. In Sparazi, there was a wide selection of therapeutic groups available to clients, and the clients are encouraged to choose what group they would like to participate in. Here, I've included a number of examples um, of some of the groups. So for example, there are resiliency groups, there is a resourcing group, there is an LGBTQ peer support group, and there is also a parent. So how then can we use research to inform practice in Sprazi? So the remainder of this case study presentation will focus on how extant research provides impetus for therapeutic services at Sprazi, and also how research findings can inform groups, for example, the parenting group. So the parenting group has been selected here as very recent research has shown that parental trauma exposure and trauma sequelae may affect child mental health and behaviour. Also, in the context of direct provision and sporazy, therapists often work with parents who carry significant trauma and mental health burdens and who live in cramped conditions and share bedrooms with their children. Using research findings while being cognizant of this contextual backdrop may go towards developing a therapeutic group which is firstly informed by research but which is also geared towards managing the daily realities of living in direct provision. So what does the research tell us? Well, firstly, I'm going to provide an overview of the research exploring mental health in forcibly displaced populations. So a seminal meta-analysis was carried out by Fazel, Wheeler and Dinesh in 2005. And this meta-analysis investigated the prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, major depression, psychotic illnesses, and generalized anxiety disorder in general populations of refugees. That is to say that these were not clinical populations of refugees. The meta-analysis included 25 studies, which altogether comprised 6,743 adult refugees and 260 child refugees. Researchers reported prevalence rates and diagnostic rates for a number of psychiatric disorders across these studies. 
So across all studies, 9% of adults fulfill diagnostic criteria for PTSD. 5% of adults fulfill diagnostic criteria for depression. 4% of adults fulfill diagnostic criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. And finally, 2% of adults fulfill diagnostic criteria for another psychotic illnesses. In the studies of child refugees, 11% of children fulfilled diagnostic criteria for PTSD. All of these studies included refugees who were resettled in high income Western countries. And researchers concluded by saying that adults resettled in high income Western countries were up to 10 times more likely to fulfill diagnostic criteria for PTSD. A second hallmark analysis was carried out by Porter and Haslam in 2005. This meta-analysis included 59 studies and it investigated how pre and post displacement factors or the socio-political context moderate refugee mental health. All studies included in this analysis had at least one non-refugee control group. Researchers reported that post-displacement conditions moderated mental health conditions. For example, institutional accommodation or living in institutional accommodation, restricted economic opportunity, being internally dis displaced, being repatriated to a country from which they had originally fled, and originating from a country which was still in conflict, were all associated with poor mental health outcomes. Additionally, refugees who were older, more educated and female, and who had higher pre-displacement socioeconomic status and rural residents also reported poor mental health outcomes. The largest systematic review and meta-analysis to date was carried out by Steele and colleagues in 2009. This study comprised 161 studies, which altogether included in excess of 80,000 refugees and other conflict affected individuals. The researchers here examined prevalence rates of PTSD and other adverse mental health outcomes in refugee populations. And they also explored associations between psychopathology and traumatic life events, for example, torture. So across the studies, the researchers reported that there was a prevalence rate of 30.6 for PTSD and the prevalence rate for depression was 30.8%. Torture was reported as a substantive risk factor for the development of PTSD and an accumulation of traumatic events was a substantive risk factor for going on to develop depression. So taken together, these studies illustrate that interplay of socio-demographic characteristics, pre-migratory trauma and post-migration stressors, and they highlight the unique and complex experiences and needs of forcibly displaced individuals. But what about forcibly displaced families? So in response to a rapidly expanding literature base depicting the negative effects of myriad traumatic events and enduring socio-political stressors on refugee psychology, there has been a marked increase in exploring diverse and indirect pathways by which war, forced displacement, migration affects individuals and their families. In 2017, Miller and Rasmussen set out to identify ongoing stressors or adverse social conditions in post-migration contexts, so the social ecology model, which mediated the relationship between pre-migratory trauma and refugee mental health. Several post-migration factors were reported as risk factors for poor individual mental health, which in turn may affect parental well-being parental capacity and family functioning. So some examples of these factors included, but are not limited to, family conflict and violence, separation from family members, 
uncertainty regarding asylum status, loss of social support networks, and discrimination. In studies of child and youth refugee mental health, social ecology models include the same factors relating to pre-migratory trauma and ongoing post-migration stressors, but they additionally include a whole host of variables related to parental and familial factors. Effects of exposure to war-related trauma can be compounded in children by parental factors and parental responses to trauma, for example, parental PTSD. These indirect effects of parental trauma exposure and trauma sequelae on child development and well-being are commonly referred to as intergenerational transmission of trauma. So one seminal study conducted in 2005 was designed in response to clinical observations which saw children of parents with a history of torture present with a wide range of psychiatric symptoms. So researchers then set out to investigate the presence and effects of intergenerational transmission of trauma in families in which one or both parents had a history of torture. A test group of 15 families were compared to a culture and ethnicity match control group of families in which parents had been exposed to other forms of violence, but not torture. Parents with a history of torture reported higher levels of PTSD, depression, somatization, anxiety and psychosocial stress symptoms when compared to the control group. Also, children in the test group, that is children with parents who had experienced torture, reported higher levels of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, attention deficits and behavioural disorders when compared with the comparison group. More recently, in 2011, there was a 23-year prospective longitudinal study which examined intergenerational effects of parental psychiatric morbidity on second-generation outcomes. And this study reported that parental PTSD at the time of arrival to the host country, this was significantly associated with mental health problems in children over time. Three years later, in 2014, Lambert, Holzer and Hasbin investigated associations between parental PTSD and children's psychological distress and they report that parental PTSD symptom profiles negatively affect child mental health and behaviour. Finally, and most recently, Nielsen and colleagues Last year, in 2019, they set out to build upon these previous findings by examining the effects, if any, of parental PTSD on child's mental health in refugee families. This was quite a large cohort study and had in excess of 50,000 child participants. So that is participants under the age of 18. Within this number, 7,486 children or young adults had a parent with post-traumatic stress disorder. The child outcome variable in this study was termed psychiatric contact, and this was defined as any psychiatric hospital contact during which a psychiatric diagnosis was met. So just to elaborate here, a psychiatric hospital contact, this could be an inpatient, an outpatient or emergency room contact during which a psychiatric diagnosis, that is a diagnosis met within the framework of the DSM. So they found that children who have been exposed to parental PTSD were at a significantly elevated risk of reporting a psychiatric contact. And also, the risk for psychiatric contact in children was higher when both parents had PTSD. So researchers interpreted these findings by suggesting that 
through data supported an intergenerational transmission of trauma in refugee families. So as we can see from discussing these few studies, there is compelling evidence for the adverse effects of parental trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder on child outcomes. However, there is also a symptomatic focus across studies. Some more recent studies have looked towards exploring the process and mechanisms by which intergenerational transmission of trauma occurs. So in other words, we're saying that, okay, there is a significant body of research which, which says that refugee children who have parents with PTSD go on to develop more issues in terms of their mental health and behaviour. But we're interested in how this occurs. What is the process? So two recent review studies published in 2016 and 2020 both identified intrafamily communication styles as the possible mechanism of this trauma transmission. So that is the ways in which parents talk about their traumatic past could be a possible mechanism for trauma transmission in refugee families. So again, intrafamily communication styles speak to the ways in which parents communicate stories of adversity, trauma and displacement to their children. An overview of the literature would suggest that there are four dominant communication styles being reported. These are silencing, open communication, modulated disclosure and unfiltered speech. Silencing can be defined as a cultivated silence about parental experiences of trauma. These parents will not and do not speak about their past experiences of trauma exposure and subsequent mental health symptomology. So this style of communication, this silencing, has been reported as being a risk factor for the development of somatic and mental health symptomology in children. The second communication style is open communication. And this can be defined as parental disclosure about their past experiences of war-related trauma. So studies exploring the effects of open communication on children have reported divergent findings. So some studies have shown a positive effect of open communication. For example, open communication has been reported as helping children develop the capacity to process their own trauma experiences. But other studies have reported a negative effect. For example, open communication has been associated with higher levels of child mental health symptomology, including anxiety. Modulated disclosure is a little similar to open communication, but this time parental disclosure is aligned with and sensitive to the cognitive, developmental and emotional capacity of the child. And studies have shown that modulated disclosure may be linked to secure attachment in children. Other studies have shown that modulated disclosure is highly embedded in culture. So it's highly dependent on the cultural background of the individual. The final communication style is unfiltered speech. And this is a style of communication in which parents report that they do not disclose details of their trauma and trauma sequelae to their children, but then they go on to provide unconscious or indecisive reports, which suggests that this may not be the case. So for an example, well, um, researchers have described an instance in which a parent reported that they do not speak about past traumatic events with their children, but then they later go on to discuss these very same events with the researcher, but within hearing range of their children. So unfiltered speech has been associated with insecure attachment in young children. So taken together, it seems that the ways in which parents communicate details of their past experiences of trauma and displacement, they may exacerbate or mitigate against intergenerational transmission of trauma. So a summary of the research thus far, 
So we have learned that forcibly displaced individuals are at an elevated risk for trauma exposure and trauma sequelae, with asylum-seeking refugee samples reporting high prevalence rates of psychological distress, for example, PTSD. Child refugees are additionally vulnerable to the effects of parental PTSD exposure, which may result in intergenerational transmission of trauma. Finally, several studies have proffered intrafamily communication styles, that is, the way parents speak about their experiences of trauma, as a potential mechanism for intergenerational transmission of trauma in forcibly displaced families. So how then can we use this research to inform practice in Sporazi? Well, firstly, these research findings, they highlight the need for existing practice. They highlight the need for very specialist rehabilitative services, which are tailored to individual experiences and needs. Furthermore, higher prevalence rates of psychological distress, for example, PTSD, they underscore the need for therapeutic services at individual, family and group levels. So moving on then to how we can absorb these research findings into a therapeutic group in Sporazi, and we're going to focus here on the parenting group. So the research that we have discussed suggests that intrafamily communication styles may offer an important area of exploration in a therapeutic group setting. And intrafamily communication styles and the research findings surrounding that can be considered when thinking about the implementation, content and delivery of a parenting group. So for example, the therapist could provide psychoeducational information to parents, firstly emphasising that many forcibly displaced parents experience mental health difficulties. This is something that is very common and they are not alone. So in a therapeutic setting or context here in Sporazi at the parenting group, there is very much a strong focus on not problematizing symptoms and behaviours but rather working towards acknowledging them and understanding them. On top of that, the therapist could then work towards opening up a conversation into the difficulties of communicating details of trauma, displacement and migration to children. The therapist can work towards providing clients with information about how different ways of communicating may affect children differently. So we're talking here about the research findings centering around open communication, silencing, modulated disclosure and unfiltered speech. How can you then adopt them and translate them into a therapeutic group setting? So for example, the therapist can provide psychoeducational information relating to developmental milestones, specifically focusing on the cognitive, developmental and emotional capacity of the child. The therapist and parents can then work towards developing strategies which align communication decisions and disclosures with the child's developmental stage. In the parenting group, the therapist and the parents can focus on identifying individual and or group challenges and then discussing possible strategies and resolutions as a group. For example, what communication difficulties do they have and can they, as a group, formulate possible resolutions to those difficulties? The therapist can also incorporate discussions about how culture can shape communication in order to formulate strategies which are sensitive to the cultural background of the parent. The therapist and parents can also discuss and address the context-specific challenges of direct provision to parental mental health and intrafamily communication styles. So to conclude overall, current research was employed to underscore the importance of existing therapeutic services in Sprazi, and reasons for this are twofold. So firstly, it shows that these services should be maintained and secondly they could also be scaled up if necessary 
Moreover, research findings can also be adopted to inform the implementation, content and delivery of therapeutic group, in this case, the parenting group. In the case of the parenting group, therapists can absorb research findings into current practice while remaining cognizant of the socio-political landscape of direct provision. So these are the references for this case study. And I would like to thank you for your time and attention.